Well, hello, and welcome to another one of our regular Tuesday sessions where we discuss essays normally by Ayn Rand. In this case, we'll be discussing an essay by Alan Greenspan, um, who uh, wrote articles for Ayn Rand's magazine and for her book, uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal in the 1960s. He would, of course, go on to be uh, the longest serving chairman of the United States Federal Reserve Board uh, as well. So, uh, and uh, his uh, career is uh, something we no doubt will get into in this, but the essay itself is The Assault on Integrity, uh, which first appeared in the Objectivist magazine and then was reprinted in Capitalism, the Unknown, Unknown Ideal, one of his two articles. This one focused on the effect of the regulatory uh, agencies on the economy and the market for integrity. The other one, which we've already discussed, gold and economic freedom. But today we're going to be discussing uh, regulation and maybe even Dr. Greenspan's evolving views, if they can be called that, on the subject. And I'm joined by two of my favorite people in the world, uh, people I'm sure very familiar to this audience, Robert and Amy Naser. Uh, long hello. So hello. It is a uh, pleasure to be with you today, uh, especially because it's a very brief but important article. And yeah, we'll also get to ask the question, does Alan still believe these things? Right. But, but first, what are these things? We've got this, this very short but, but really kind of packed article. And it's yeah. worth mentioning for anybody who's relatively new to these that when Ayn Rand published the Objectivist Newsletter, and then later the Objectivist magazine. And essays like this were part of those periodicals. They didn't get published in the periodicals without her keen eye. So even though this isn't written by Ayn Rand, a substantial part of it just as well could have been. It reads yes. like it, 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 it's got the Ayn Rand uh, imprint on it. Yeah, especially the last paragraph, I should say. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no. The way he develops the whole argument is thoroughly objectivist. He uses Ayn Rand's basic arguments about uh, each of these things along the way, which suggests at the time that he very much agreed with her position, uh, for sure. And he argues it, uh, as you say, in a very condensed and even very powerful way. He, he delivers the point. And the general point here, let's talk the article first, uh, uh, the, the general point that uh, Greenspan makes here, which is a classic point about objectivism, is that regulatory agencies do incredible harm to the consumer. Agencies designed to protect the consumer are counterproductive in that effect uh, because they are done at the point of a gun, as opposed to being the product of the rational judgment and choices of consumers and producers on a free market. That, in effect, when government comes in with something like the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1914, which was designed to protect people from dangerous snake oil and bad medicines and corrupted foods and so forth, uh, that when you have a regula regulatory agency like that, what it will do is it will there's an equivalent to Gresham's law, uh, Greenspan points out here, just as good, uh, bad money drives out good. What were you going to say, Robert? No, I was just, gonna, just going to make that, that point that, uh, yeah, just as bad money drives out good money, bad protections drive out good protection. It happens all the time. He points out that what turns what is thought to be, well, these are minimums that the industry has to uh, meet, turn out to be maximums. And those maximums are no better protected by the government, in fact, far worse protected by the government than they are on a free market. Um, their examples are <laughs> numerous, and we and we go on all day with the various examples. Just uh, use the Pure Food and Drug Act, one of the great d disasters in the history of medicine in the United States was the prescription of thalidomide uh in the 19 uh, uh late 50s and six uh, early 60s which caused tremendous birth defects um of course that happened under the fda we had a pure food and drug administration that approved the use of this so an fda did not prevent this uh well-known famous case where babies would be born with birth defects because they didn't know the effect on pregnant women or nursing women uh of thalidomide yet but it was a disaster of the FDA, not of the free market. It did cause changes 
to the way the uh, FDA uh, permits uh, foods or drugs to be put on the market. Drugs now have to be um, not just preliminarily, but completely tested to be both safe and effective. Now, the other side of that has caused death and disaster on a vast scale. Beta blockers, commonly used, for example, to reduce blood pressure in heart patients today, uh, were widely prescribed in Europe, known to be safe for decades, but because the FDA was taking its sweet time to approve that it was perfectly safe and perfectly effective all the way through, uh, caused hundreds of thousands of uh, middle-aged heart patients in this country to die as they were waiting for a drug. Now, if, you're, if you've got serious heart disease, you, the risk of taking an experimental drug might have a whole different calculation, a different downside for you. If you've got terminal cancer, your downside for a for a experimental drug might be totally different than someone else, a healthy young person, say. But you're not given that option. The FDA does not permit you to take beta blockers for year after year after year. And so men are dying, middle-aged men are dying literally in the tens and hundreds of thousands uh, from heart attacks, you know, the widow makers, as they were classically called, um, uh, whereas uh, those same people were being saved uh, in Europe. So these safety regulations can be deadly at either end. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have a thought on that. I do, I do. I want to read something real quick and then I want to say something about it. From the article, the guiding purpose of the government regulator is to prevent rather than to create something. He gets no credit if a new miraculous drug is discovered by drug company scientists. He does if he blocks, if he, excuse me, if he bans the thalidomide. Such emphasis on the negative sets the framework under which even the most conscientious regulators must operate. The result is a growing body of restrictive legislation on drug experimentation, testing, and distribution. As in all research, it's impossible to add restrictions to the development of new drugs without simultaneously cutting off the secondary rewards of such research, the improvement of existing drugs. Quality improvement and innovation are inseparable. The point is these are barriers to production. They don't produce anything. All they do is, is encourage people to play it safe and to do the very least with the research that they do. You know, one of the few, we've got a few folks in the chat who are, I think, uh, uh, criticizing some of the, the, the left. And I'm going to jump on board with that because one of the few, I keep a list of 10 good things that Donald Trump did because I'm the harshest critic of Donald Trump you're ever going to meet. And I've got to be able to say, well, here were the good parts. So then I can go into the 25 bad things. One of the things fair, that he did, <laughs> yes, one of the things that came out of it that, that this article makes plain should have happened long, long ago was the so-called right to try. Mm -hmm. And there, there's just no moral justification for, as you say, somebody who is already in a difficult position, in a life-threatening situation or some other debilitating illness that's making their life miserable, to not have that right to say, well, here's something which our existing regulations make unlawful, but which I should have the right to take, to take that risk, to take that on myself. And it's exactly the point that's made in the article that, well, but by setting up regulations that everybody's got to follow, that apply to every situation, that are necessarily the least common denominator, you then cut off all of those opportunities. And not yeah. just the many people, although it's probably the most important part, all of those people who would be helped, but think of all of the new discoveries and, and, and new uses that would be found by having that right. Right. And it doesn't prevent bad drugs from coming to market. Anyone who watches American television ads and sees those lawyer ads uh, about how you can sue X, Y, and Z company uh, still for strict liability shows how our regulatory agencies, which are out there to protect human lives and human safety, let all kinds of deadly stuff still get through. Stuff that the manufacturers or at the FDA may at the time not have known was deadly, but that's the point. The, yes. uh, you, you, the uh, government is not omniscient, and indeed, government is no less uh, honest than business people are. At least in private business, you have competition. You have a choice for individual judgment. Things can be sorted out <laughs> through that much, much more quickly than through uh, that heavy one-size-fits-all hand of regulation. 
As you point out, companies spend enormous amounts of money just to comply with the regulation rather than improve the quality of existing drugs or innovate with new drugs, and that is also a way in which it devastates markets. Um, snake oil is commonly still sold. I mean, home homeopathic uh, remedies are still sold, and as I say, even dangerous stuff is still sold for which uh, manufacturers get sued all the time. So the FDA has no guarantee of safety. It has not done its job in effect, but what it has done is given a sort of a seal of approval, a sort of a, it's replaced what the, and the main point of this article is that there is a market for quality. And that market for quality is destroyed by government regulations. It gives the consumer a false sense of security to have the government stamp of approval, some government inspector, some government approval, some building inspector, some FDA uh, commission says it's okay. And that is supposed to reassure us when, of course, they're no more omniscient than anyone else, the inventors, the, the manufacturers, the consumers. And the consumer is a crucial part of that chain. There, there is a chain that these regulators don't fully appreciate from the initial innovator to the producer, say with medicine, the pharmaceutical company, but it doesn't stop there and they do something wrong and we sue them. No, it goes to the doctor and the doctor is not going to prescribe these drugs exactly. if he can't be convinced, but it doesn't stop there. It then goes to the patient who is not a doctor, but does minimal investigations, determines, I think my doctor's right about this, tries it out. If something goes wrong, he then is part of the process as well. And by cutting off the judgment, of any link in that chain by saying, oh, you don't need to worry about that. We figured out that it meets this standard of this code of this regulation, and therefore there's no thought required on your end. It does. Yeah. It substitutes yeah. judgment. It displaces ongoing uh, rationality and thought in the subject because you've just got this government stamp of approval. You know, Kellogg's Corn Flakes had an impeccable, I'm not recommending breakfast cereal as good nutrition. I'm going to get that out of the way. But you know, Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Or, or, as a way to uh, tap down your, your lust. <laughs> yes. but, but, you know, companies like Kellogg's Corn Flakes had an impeccable reputation for safety and quality decades before the FDA came along. Why? How could that be? How could it be that in the absence of some federal agency protecting us from dangerous foods, that yes. companies could have such perfect track records for safety? It's the free market for integrity. Yes. A, reputa a business's reputation is all important to them. One little mistake. Remember a few years back when the fast food chain uh, Jack in the Box had literally two cases of E. coli that put customers into the hospital. They were nearly went, they nearly went bankrupt. They came that close from going completely under because of just two cases. One where a person just got sick. The other person died and had complications. But just one person got sick. Two cases of E. coli nearly. Or think of uh, what was that airline? Jet Blue? One crash nearly put them entirely out of it. Let me suggest that it is not the FDA that keeps our hamburgers safe at fast food restaurants. Let me suggest that it has nothing to do with the FAA that, has, uh, that keeps our planes safe in the air. No, it is the market uh, uh, and the reaction of consumers on the market that most keeps our planes safely in the air. It's the risk of a JetBlue going out of business because of one crash or a jack-in-the-box uh, uh, going out of business because of one E. coli incident. That's what keeps our food safe. That's what keeps our airplanes in the air. No government regulation. Um, quite the opposite. Government regulations tend to reduce things to minimum standards, as we say, which quickly become the maximum standards because the company is so busy complying with it. I remember when I was a teenager, I worked in a factory. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, famously known as OSHA in this country, <laughs> has all kinds of workplace safety rules. And, you know, you'd think going into it, oh, it's about safety, you know, safety goggles when you're working on a drill press or something. No, 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 no. The uh, OSHA regulated, mind you, the distance between the ceramic toilet bowl and the toilet seat. It had to be, you know, so many centimeters or so many inches between the ceramic toilet bowl and the and the seat that's how detailed the regulations got well you know uh when the company is spending so much time having to comply 
with regulations which really have nothing to do with occupational safety or health except through some weird theoretical you know complaint by some regulator uh they don't have time to do all kinds of other things which also by the way can relate to safety and quality no it's it's the free market that keeps the product safe it has nothing to do with regulations people have a totally misunderstanding totally misunderstand this and, and um, i think and i think this is something that alan greenspan forgot in, in the, his later years in the 80s is that uh there are pe more people are out there that that have good judgment than not yes and, and, and he seems to think that businesses like jet blue just walk away they take the profits they've made and give up right businesses, businesses like jack in the box oh they just shut down take the money and run you know, yeah. one can, you know, it got worse and worse progressively with Alan Greenspan's every, every time he testified before Congress, it seemed from the late 80s through the early 21st century, his testimony seemed to get further and further from um, arguments that he made with great clarity and, and persuasion. He didn't really give arguments against them. He didn't really have a case for regulation, but he started using these anti-concepts that he apparently had learned differently from, you know, from Ayn Rand about like greed, you know, this crazy greed that, that's out of control. And so rather than actually constructing an argument as he does in this article, which I think is pretty much irrefutable, uh, you know, the, the market for integrity, uh, uh, he, he actually just makes vague, you know, uh, he brings out the old socialist bromides about greed and, um, yeah, I, no. I found one quote from him. I, I'm not entirely sure when he said it, but I'm sure it was later. It says, I guess I should warn you, if I turn out to be particularly clear, you've probably misunderstood what I've said. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the question then becomes, is he being intentionally obscure so that they don't get him? I think that initially was uh, strategy. Yeah, um, it's just you cannot hoodwink people into freedom. The one honest thing he does <laughs> is acknowledge right up front, I'm a rationalist. I'm, right. I'm, these are my ideas, but they're not the ideas I live by. And that gets to the definition of integrity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I so to I what just, extent was he just saying that to get appointed or to get political approval? Uh, and to what extent did he really believe that? It, I think you'd have to psychologize Alan Greenspan. Yeah. Was he selling exactly. out for power? saying things he wanted them to hear? Or did he really change his opinion? Because his later position was not a full-blown logical argument based on all kinds of facts, such as this uh, article is. He really uses great examples like stockbrokers, how their reputation is everything. Yes. You know, they'll do they'll do million dollar transactions on a single phone call. And if one of those goes wrong, the brokerage house must be out of business like that. So their integrity is all important to them, all right. important to them. And rather than provide examples like that on a free market, he just sort of gives vague bromides towards the end of his career. So but in any event, I think it's pretty clear that he was a total sellout, whatever he actually believed. It's, it's a theme that's come up in the uh, discussions that you've had of Leonard Peikoff's lectures and especially some of the some of the challenging topics about pragmatism and what happens when somebody gives up on principles and that seems to be the case here reading the the new york times article with greenspan for example the one uh, 10 15 years ago he might as well have just said what can you do when you have to deal with people <laughs> right <laughs> he, he said i underestimated the greed how, how could he say to the new york times you know part of my mistake was i underestimated the greed of businessmen the very opening of this article. Exactly. Greed is the very thing that protects consumers. It is precisely the greed of the businessman, or more appropriately, his profit seeking, which is the unexcelled protector of the consumer. And that sounds a little rationalistic, but think about it. That's absolutely the case. Again, the, the jet blues are the jack in the box. They don't just walk away and they do try to recover by reestablishing their reputation. And as he points out, it takes decades in some industries for a company to develop the kind of reputation they need to be a major player. And the one thing he leaves out that he doesn't mention, but as you suggest, there is the law. So in the case of that unscrupulous businessman who opens up shop with the intention of taking your money and walking right. away in a rational legal system, which you know, arguably 
we have a ways to go, but ways to go. The point is, we, we can still track that guy down. We can still sue him. We still, and, and those protections, I can't even say they're better than government protections because better implies that government protections are good and not harmful, but there's, yes, but we have protections. What it requires, what they don't like, Robert, is that it requires the person bringing a suit against uh, the company to prove that they were in fact harmed by that company. In yes. an individual case by case basis, they don't want that. They want a, a gross regulation, you see. But how is it? This is another point that Dr. Greenspan uh, made very eloquently in the original article. We're told that businesses are greedy. They can't be trusted. They're unscrupulous. No, they, they, they'll be happy to harm their, their own, kill their own consumers <laughs> that they'll need the next year. But government, no, they're angels, they're saints. If there's if if businessmen are subject to uh, corner cutting and, and and things like that, then of course bureaucrats are. Yes, the examples are legion on this. For example, building inspectors and building codes. You know, I have to tell a story. Oh, tell tell please. <laughs> I worked at the DA's office in San Diego for many years, and mind you, a conservative-minded, right-wing, semi-capitalist, semi I would get that best, I would call him, insisted to, on, to me one day that we need consumer uh, protection regulations of this sort. And he cited as his example, building codes. And he said, Jim, I'm going to prove to you today that we need building codes. Okay. So we went to lunch that day and he drove me by a new housing development that was being built here in San Diego. And he showed me one house where the, the house was literally, the they didn't do the, I don't know what the, where the error was, but part of the hill had slipped down and about a third of the house now was just hanging over. <laughs> he just says, look at that, look at that. That developer allowed that house, I know he built you know 10,000 other houses, but he allowed that house to be you know built on, a, on, a, on shoddy land and, a, and so the land fell out and look at that poor uh, consumer there of him. So I said, it's a good thing we had building codes. <laughs> the other guy in the car with me who agreed with me about these things just started laughing. But the poor Paul, the guy, I don't mean to would pick on him, he didn't even get it. Boy, it's a good thing we have building codes, so stuff like that never, ever happens. Yeah. No, of course, it still happens. It yes. happens all the time. And why does it happen? And he even had the answer. Well, it's yeah. a lot easier to bribe a building inspector yes. than it is to comply. Yeah. Well, right, right. so the building codes give us this false sense of security precisely because it gives the government stamp of approval, which might just be a product of some bribe of a building inspector. That is right. And a lot of these inspectors and, and, and um, regulators, what do they know about building? I don't know. <laughs> what sort of stagnated concept of the actual industry do they have? Yes. Now, right. I, I could go on and I will, and I know you will too, but we have to take a moment, I think, now because we've got super chatters. Folks have chimed in with a few dollars to help support the Ayn Rand Center UK. Yay. And uh, Jeff Bannister is on board for $3 Canadian. Thank you for that. Uh, you. Jamie Hernandez is on for $4.99 Mexican pesos, about $23, $24, our, our top super chat of the day. With, and with the icon that says you are amazing, and I'm sure he means that about you, Councillor Valiant. Muchas gracias. <laughs> oh, you know, you too. Come on. <laughs> Although Mrs. Naser is looking awfully sharp. We, we did dress in business yeah. attire. Yes, uh, I, I've got my, my wealthy um, oil-based fur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean uh, polyester there? Is that what yes. you're saying? Well, we're all about Thank the fossil you, oil, fuels. Oil industry. Right, exactly. <laughs> Save the seal and you burn some oil. <laughs> but, but yes, you can support the Ayn Rand Center UK. Get on board with the Super Chat. Send a little money. Send us a question. Any mm -hmm. questions you have, give us the tough questions. Yes. Like, well, what is your answer to pragmatism? In a country, in a legislature, in a business environment as corrupt as ours, don't you have to compromise your principles? Don't you have to be an Alan Greenspan in order to do business would, these days? I would want to point out something else that I think is an impl implication of this article. Um, you know, one of the follow-ups I had with my friend Paul, who wanted to prove the need for building codes, but showed, in fact, their defects to me with his own eyes. Um, I asked him, do you think that older buildings were built better? Better craftsmanship? 
The but Roman roads are still there. Longer lasting. And he had he was very familiar with the new houses versus old. We have a so much of San Diego has been newly built. So he's very familiar with the older, you know, 100 year old buildings and homes here as opposed to the new developments. And he said, there's no question. The older homes are built more sturdy. They'll last through earthquakes. They're, they, they are, they're, the craftsmanship is just much finer. Sure, there have been technological improvements. And then I ask him, well, why is it the old buildings are normally grandfathered in when there are technological improvements? Very rarely do they re require retrofits when they change uh, building codes. Hmm. 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 <laughs> There's really no good logical answer. But the truth is that the quality of our products has gone down. And likewise, let me suggest that the honesty and integrity of businesses has necessarily gone down as well. Given this false sense of security that a government stamp of approval gives, given the fact that they're working hard to uh, get the approval of the government uh, and not really innovate and not really concern themselves with other things, because to the extent, I'll go further, every regulation adds a cost to businesses, makes it harder for new businesses to enter the field and compete, yeah. And it, it forces the company to spend more and more of its uh, resources on complying with regulation as opposed to improving the safety and quality of their product. Both undeniable points. Not only do they not have any incentive to reach more than the least common denominator, all of those extra costs and burdens mean they can barely afford to reach that least common denominator. Precisely right. Precisely right. No, if, if you were to ask me, these regulatory agencies designed to protect the consumers are worse than unnecessary. They hurt, they actively hurt the consumer by destroying, in effect, this market, a market for integrity and quality. Yes. That's the way I'd summarize it. Uh, you know, they, they, boy, the examples could go on all day, couldn't they? Because ev I can't think of a single such regulatory agency that actually helps. When they regulate brokerage firms, for example, they didn't increase the reliability of Merrill Lynch. What they did do is give Merrill Lynch all kinds of protections until, you know, what does it manifest in? The Wall Street bailout of 2008, 2009 under uh, George Bush. Um, they are too big to fail. We have to protect them. No matter how egregious their business decisions, we're going to save them. So if at the end of the day, our uh, Fed policy or our policy towards uh, encouraging housing and keeping interest rates low and our subsidies to get people to buy houses, if that policy fails, right, then it's not the government's fault. And it's certainly not these uh, financial institutions that were playing right into it and making money from it. They're too big to fail, you see. In fact, let me go further. It is in the interest of existing companies who want to keep competition out to have these agencies. These agencies, as I say, increase the costs of entry. They make it harder for competition to enter the market. And they do create this minimum standard that they have to reach and that can be a product of their own influence on the regulators or politicians yes barriers to entry that have no business being there you know the classic is if you want to polish somebody's nails in california you can't compete with the established nail salons because there are all these barriers that have no reason no sense being there none whatever to cut hair <laughs> to to do manicures you have to have a government license. But even, let me go so far as to say, even in the case of doctors and lawyers, the first professions that were uh, licensed in this country, and, and those licenses go back some time. Uh, but even in those cases, what they do is they restrict the market so that it drives up the costs when people need legal and medical services. It reduces the choices that consumers have, and it drives up costs, making those uh, services less accessible to ordinary people. And how is it that we still have shady doctors or shady lawyers? And the of answer, course, and it's the not answer so is, prevents it. <laughs> yeah, the answer is once you're in, once you've overcome that barrier the government put there, that's now blocking anybody from coming and competing with you. And you're shielded in this aura of government protection. I've got the license, you see. I've got the FDA approval. I, I meet these business, uh, the building inspectors, you know, inspection. And so you've got this false sense of security in addition.
It's just what they want. Uh, if you're an unscrupulous businessman who's already in the market, you want to keep out the market for integrity, competition based on quality. And that's exactly how they use and why so many businesses are actively supporters of and lobbyists for these uh, regulatory agencies. It is a, it's one of the great big lies of our time that these agencies, A, do anything to protect the consumer, and B, are not really a way of keeping out uh, competition and destroying the market for integrity. It, it's a swindle. It's so a these, swindle. Re these regulations then pervert the market. They pervert the incentives. They disconnect virtue, mm -hmm. the virtuous businessman, from the rewards of his virtue. And, and they corrupt money itself, yes. the exchange of value between people. I, yeah, I, I like this uh, quote by Ayn Rand, money rests on the axiom that every man is the owner of his mind and his effort. And, and when, so when I think of money, I think of creativity, I think of your ability to use reason as your only tool of survival, your, your, your nature as a human being to actually innovate and to, to create and to make the wor your own world better for yourself and your loved ones. And so anytime I hear somebody talking about, oh, I'm going to manipulate the market, I'm going to handle the money for those, you know, those irrational people. What the, what, I mean, it, I, all I see is, <laughs> I have to say this, Alan Greenspan with his big giant vat of blood sticking his hands into it and having it, <laughs> it uh, slop it, off of his it, hands. Well, it, it's, it, it's, it is so... Make such a brilliant philosophical point. Huh. All that we've been discussing here today yeah. is the concretization of a fundamental point of objectivism. Force and mind are mm -hmm. opposites. Yes. Regulation works by force. It sh shuts down minds. It shuts down the operation of the mind of the producer and the mind of the consumer as relevant factors. Yes. It is only the, the judgment of the regulator who can't, you know, he's part of a pure permanent bureaucracy that matters. He has no self-interest in the matter or whatever, except, you know, covering his tail, as Robert points out. That's his only interest. So what in effect what we've done is we've replaced judgment with a gun, just yeah. as Ayn yeah. Rand says. Right. And each one of these examples is a beautiful, eloquent example of how force and mind are opposites. Brilliant and, and, point. And, well, thank you. And I'd like to just say one more thing, if anybody wants to reread that, uh, the article that Alan Greenspan wrote um, uh, uh, in the Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Um, Robert and I were rereading it and we, and let me know if this rings true for you, but we found some of the passages to be a bit rationalistic, <laughs> or I should say not drilling down to the fundamental points of uh, the nature of man, of reason, of, of individuals acting instead of you know, I, I just found the lack of his, his um, use of the word individual as kind of a bit of a red flag in that article, but it, I just want to throw that out. He could have yeah. used a course in reduction. Right. Mm -hmm. Grounding to reality. Yes. Well, you know, it's like these, I, you know, I hate, you know, look at the, boy, the recent examples have been numerous, haven't they? You remember that residential Florida high rise, the collapse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boy, another great victory for building codes in Florida, huh? Um, another example of why we so need building codes. <laughs> no, it's obviously an example of how, uh, and in fact, when you just open the lid on that one case, yeah. ugh, building yeah. inspectors were told, uh, were told the owner and the owner told the, and yet the inspectors themselves, the government regulators were letting it go. Why? Because of their cozy relationship with the land managers who controlled the building. So it was the, uh, the property manager and the regulators sort of working together to create this perfect storm that caused uh, the building to collapse and people to die. That was a classic example of, you know, and people will cite that as the kind of example for why we need government safety regulations. No, yes. it's a perfect example of how government safety regulations kill. <clears throat> No, it needs, wow, boy, the, <laughs> I could go on all day with examples like this, like our vaccine yeah. mandates, right? Yes. Instead yes. of having an, in, going back to your point about individual judgment, yes. instead of letting someone make an individual assessment, you know, a parent says, you know, my 10-year-old child has 
a lower risk from the COVID than maybe from the side effects of the of the vaccine. A provable fact, one way or another, if the government would release the data on such things, but the individual judgment of the parent is overridden. Or the person who says, look, I've already had COVID. I had the original COVID, I had the Delta variant. Why should I get vaccinated? My immunity is probably superior. And again, the government suspiciously doesn't want us to really have all the data on this, right. which in itself is suspicious. But what they want to do is supplant individual judgment with some one size fits all government mandated yeah. safety rule uh, right. through OSHA, mind you, the president wanted to do this. But of yeah. course, so far outside of OSHA's original legal mandate that even the courts have stopped it, right? I saw back in March of uh, 2002, uh, last year, um, this whole consequence of uh, basically these bureaucrats and the government uh, forcing people to lock down, forcing the people to stay in their home and, and uh, say, do as I say, and don't use your own judgment. Don't think about this. Don't think about the facts of this of the matter. Don't delve, don't research this yourself. Right. Uh, and, and it is that has been well that has been bad in two fronts um in in the way that people have conformed and in the way that people have rebelled against it and yeah. I, to to your point about homeopathy i think <laughs> that's <laughs> a lot that there's some of that in in the rebellion uh in people's rebelling and of of uh this you know this the government oh, says it's good oh, therefore it's bad isn't that awful see i am vaccinated mm -hmm. i looked at the science myself yep I looked at my own situation as I'm getting older, and I thought to myself, being vaccinated makes sense for me. But the individual, when you take away the individual decision, there's going to be all kinds of people, when you point the gun, there's going to be all kinds of people just say no, just because you pointed the gun. And maybe they, to some extent, I have some sympathy with them. They obviously should yeah. still be judging individually each case for their own interest, uh, in, with their own interest in mind. But you can understand why it just uh, engenders um, resentment mm -hmm. against the, the whole thing of getting a vaccine. I mean, it's a strange thing. I just and now I'm okay. Maybe I was virtue signaling or something, but I told the world that I was vaccinated and I lost five f Facebook friends just like that right. from saying that I was back, just merely saying, not telling people I'm, in favor, I'm opposed to the mandates, but just telling people that I had yeah. been vaccinated because it's all politics, right? And, and imagine if you took the, if you had taken the politics out of all of this, if yeah. you had not had mandates, if the lockdowns had ended after 15 days like they were supposed right. to. Right, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve, and we're here a year and a half, two years later almost. Right? How many people do you know? I certainly know plenty of them. People on the right, I'll put up my air quotes here, people on the right who would have taken the vaccines if it wasn't political. Right. Again, exactly. it's 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 the, the unintended consequences. I shouldn't even say unattended unintended it's just the consequences yeah. of making it politics and again trying to establish that least common denominator that lowest possible standard you guys are on fire you're making all kinds of great points isn't the lock aren't the lockdowns themselves the ultimate here yeah. isn't that this is the logical conclusion of regulation designed to protect us of course more people We've known this for since the, almost the lockdowns began. The data has shown, you know, even a, a so dubious an organization as the World Health Organization said that tens of millions of children worldwide would be thrown into starvation because of the lockdowns in America and in Western Europe. Uh, when you have the biggest economies in the world shut down, the economic ripple effects will go all across the world, just like a virus will go all across the world. Only in the case of economic ripples, it will cause children to starve to death in places like Africa. Africa and South Asia and South America. And so we had good data. I mean, in many states, uh, the increase in juvenile suicides has been more than the COVID deaths from juveniles in the same state. So yes. in my view, at the end of the day, the lockdowns might prove far deadlier than COVID. I mean, the body count, the literal body count from the lockdowns. So, and we know they don't really work at this point. We have good evidence that there's no indication that lockdowns work. Even Joe Biden said no lockdowns this yes, time for yes, the uh, newest variant, that. right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think we, we may have learned our lesson out. there. But, but isn't that the classic example? Yeah. Rather than thinking about anything but safety, see, safety, safety, safety when it came to COVID, and that mono-minded focus on we don't want people to die from COVID, Right. They did not even think about the role of individual judgment here or the ramifications of the regulation in terms of uh, the health and safety of, of people in every other way.
I mean, in New York, they just closed the governor of New York without a single case of the new variant in New York. She shut down Mm -hmm. uh, elective uh, uh, surgeries. This means that if you think you might have cancer, your doctor thinks you might have cancer, your cancer Mm -hmm. detection screening will be delayed. That means that if the doctor thinks that you have heart disease, your heart screening or your uh, uh, angiogram will be delayed so that we, for what? Not a single case of the new variant is in New York yet. It's so interesting how altruism works. Isn't it? <laughs> um, and, and Isn't I should it? say destroy lives. I mean, and, and when you you mentioned earlier about resentment, I need to say that the counterpoint to resentment is guilt. And so, you know, not as Cuomo said, not one life must be, uh, right. uh, you know, <laughs> gone. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody has to be fe- feeling guilty about uh, going out and going grocery shopping, for goodness sake, um, and, you know, getting food and, and uh, whether or not people are going to actually spread this and that and the other thing. And, and it, it, it was just such a awful um, flip-flopping of guilt and resentment last year and this year too. Oh, but yeah. it, it, so it really warped people's minds, I really do think. And, well, and, the thing is, is you know, yeah. something like the, like the ordinary flu, which mm-hmm. people got, get every year, right? There's a death count yeah. every year to the ordinary flu. Have you ever worried about how many people you killed by spreading the flu to them. What an extraordinary <laughs> thing to make people feel guilty about spreading an infectious disease, which only has a certain small percentage of hospitalization or fatality. So your odds of not being hospitalized or dying from even the the first COVID variant was 99.9 something percent. So w- wait a minute here. Every single death is the fault of anyone who might have even unknowingly transmitted the disease and transmitted the disease and transmitted the disease to someone. This is bizarre guilt that we're putting down on people. You are not responsible if you don't know. I mean, they were even saying that innocent transmission, I don't even know that I have the antibodies, is somehow your fault. When have we ever regarded disease that way? I mean, when Hong Kong flu hit in the the late 60s, that was when Woodstock happened. (laughs) Right. Right. Uh, Yeah. Uh, No, it's insane. And and all you have to do is say, we're the government and we're here to protect lives and we don't want a single life lost. And now you've got totalitarian powers and you don't even consider the other end and look at the other end. They shut down life, life for the living. People were put under basically house arrest. They couldn't go to the theater, right. they couldn't go to concerts, and, they couldn't go to museums, they couldn't go to their work unless they were right. essential, essential right. workers. And, uh, it, it, you know, your job is essential to your life, of course, but uh, they didn't think so. I, I um, learned about a particular regulation that I didn't know about before, which was um, how government tells the medical industry that they cannot build so many hospitals or they cannot have more than so many beds in a particular state. I, I forget exactly what it's called, but I thought that is the most evil thing I've ever heard. How How is it that it's been two years and we haven't built, we could have built new hospitals by this time. And, and I, and I know, and um, I, I know I have, I have a lot of respect for epidemiologists, um, including Amish Adalja. Um, and, but my gosh, I mean, I know that we're trying to keep it, keep the, um, keep the cases down or keep the deaths down. So there isn't so many hospitalizations. So hospitals are no, not overrun, but for goodness sake, why haven't we built more beds? I, I don't true. understand. Back in the seventies, people said there was a glut of hospital beds back in the early eighties, a glut of hospital, too many hospital beds. And if the government is going to be subsidizing this, we've got to cut costs. And so that's where those regulations come from. So that by the beginning of the 21st century, everyone was talking about the chronic hospital bed shortage. And so by the time you get to COVID in 2020, uh, uh, we ha- were in a position where medical resources, just the basic infrastructure resources in hospitals gave us, uh, put us in a position where our uh, medical system might be overwhelmed by a new infectious disease pandemic. Uh, it was, of course, the situation was far worse in Europe where socialized medicine has basically reduced the resources to, I mean, they have a huge waiting uh, lists for uh, medical procedures in socialized countries, generally speaking. And that chronic under shortage of capital in, in medicine created real problem. I mean, 
poor Italy, you know, with people, you know, dying in the streets and not enough doctors so that they'd have to even make choices as to who's going to die and who's not, uh, as the hospitals overflow, you know, in Milan. Uh, that was horrific. But that's a question of medical resources. And of course, a free market in medicine would provide the adequate, in fact, an abundance of such medical resources. Yes. You know, as Amy said, the final paragraph of this essay, which maybe I should just go ahead and read. Please. Uh, the this, article. This, 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 this could have been, and I can't help but think maybe it was Ayn Rand looking over Alan I Greenspan's so. shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the hallmark of collectivists is their deep-rooted distrust of freedom and of the free market process. But it is their advocacy of so-called consumer protection that exposes the nature of their basic premises with particular clarity by preferring force and fear to incentive and reward as a means to human motivation, they confess their view of man as a mindless brute functioning on the range of the moment whose actual self-interest lies in flying by night and making quick kills. They confess their ignorance of the role of intelligence in the production process, of the wide intellectual context and long range vision required to maintain a modern industry. They confess their inability to grasp the crucial importance of the moral values, which are the motive power of capitalism. Capitalism is based on self-interest and self-esteem. It builds integrity and trustworthiness as cardinal virtues and makes them pay off in the marketplace, thus demanding that men survive by means of virtue not of vices. It is this superlatively moral system that the welfare statists propose to improve upon by means of preventive law, snooping bureaucrats, and the chronic good <coughs> of fear. Boy. We didn't even touch on that preventative law aspect, but what yeah, a powerful that was mentioned, summary. yeah. What yep. a powerful summary. All these regulations are, of course, the, sort of like that science fiction movie that they did with Tom Cruise where they arrest you before the crime. Yes. It's, it's the same thing. If you, if you don't meet their government regulations, even if no one's been harmed, even if the product hasn't come to market, you can be the government can crack down on you. They presume guilt, in other words, on the part of the, the manufacturer, the service provider, rather, rather than presume innocence as they do with criminals. <laughs> Businesses don't get the same presumption the criminal people charged with murder do. So uh, think about that. But the, the co connection there between virtue and uh, uh, the left's attitude about human nature is critical here. Yeah. They do not believe that human beings are capable of rational thought or are free agents or should be left to their own devices to make their life their own lives as best as they can. No, they do not. If, and this is, runs across the board across the board the left does not appreciate in the role of incentives in capitalism motives what for example indiscriminate welfare might do to, to motives uh what uh, uh business subsidies might do to the motives of the businessman etc etc and i mean all the way down the line we have to be treated like we are toddlers uh in a crib uh, and otherwise we would what we'd kill ourselves, you know, business, these unscrupulous businessmen would be out instead of the real history being known, like I say, Kellogg's cornflakes impeccable record before the FDA or Thomas or, or uh, yeah, Thomas Edison, or Henry Ford and the reputation his cars got, uh, but yeah. all in the absence of, of government regulation. Um, it, it, it's absolutely bizarre to think that businessmen will want to kill their consumers, consumers they need, presumably, to be around next year, much less five or ten years from now. It's just utterly bizarre. The interests of the, of the producer are to satisfy as many customers as possible, not to kill any of them at all. So, uh, whereas no such incentives exist on the part of bureaucrats. On the other hand, bureaucrats are wise and they wield their gun <laughs> and can force us, uh, you know, force us into their compliance with their view of the way things should be done. And of course, they're angels and saints with no motives. And they can never be bribed, and they don't have uh, biased judgments, etc. Well, I, I should I should remind also. I recently read um, a passage of Ayn Rand somewhere, but she she pointed out the fact that politicians and bureaucrats are only the product of the particular moral code of the culture. 
of, of the uh, of the people who have that that morality that allow that that actually accept it that embrace the morality of altruism in this case. You guys are on fire, making brilliant <laughs> point after brilliant point. That is exactly right. And I, there's nothing to say. You said it so well. That... Well, we always come back to that because people sometimes will say, yeah, well, yeah. the left is doing this and the right is doing that. And there's all these behind the scenes shenanigans and them follow the money. And all of that's true. And it's all going on. But none of that would be happening if it wasn't for the power of the underlying ideas. Yes. Oh, Some man, think about it. The more the, Someone had a, that brilliant meme the other day. The less government does, the less it matters who's in power. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is to say, uh, you know, uh, the, the more government does, the more control over our, the details of our lives that they have, the more a company is interested in buying the politician. If, for example, uh, uh, the Congress is considering antitrust laws against social media companies, oh, oh well, the social media companies are going to go, you know, kiss the rear ends of politicians and try yes. and placate these politicians. That's what's going to happen. And to the extent that the businessmen do uh, wield uh, power by buying politicians, it's only because these politicians have the life and death power over their industries, the businessmen and the consumers in that market. If it weren't the case, there'd be no reason to bribe the government because they wouldn't have the power to control it in the first place. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And it's it's unfortunate that Chairman Greenspan didn't stick with his. And I really believe, you know, he claimed that he was going to do the job as the chairman of the economic advisors. To try to get the economy as close to what it would be without all these onerous regulations as possible. Right. And I think that over time, pragmatism and maybe a little power lust. And, and a real lack of courage yeah. and cynicism led to the abandonment of his ideals. He eventually, he explicit in the New York Times, he explicitly renounced Ayn Rand's ideas yeah. and acknowledged that he had been idealistic and naive about how virtuous businessmen would be in a free market. When, what so he, funny, the example, the only example he gives there was what was going on in his time right then, which was a direct product of the mixed economy. Yes. Well, what he really acknowledged was that he had been idealistic and naive about how virtuous he would be over time. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. That's a burn. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I tend to think that given the thin nature of his argumentation, thick on rhetoric, thick on bromides that would appease politicians, but thin on argumentation. I'm not sure how much he really believed what he was saying to get power. And I think power was getting the office and getting the power and reputation uh, was the goal for him. So I'm not sure what he actually believed then. I do know his the actual arguments he made were shoddy compared to the arguments he's making here mm -hmm. while he's with Ayn Rand. And it's true that while Ayn Rand was still alive in the 1970s, when he was uh, a formal advisor to Nixon and then became the chief economic advisor to Ford, he was uh, then uh, saying, uh, still being an objectivist and saying mostly the right things. Whereas uh, after Ayn Rand's death, things started going south in a hurry and he began to compromise uh, to the point that even before the end of the Reagan administration, he was appointed Fed chairman. See, when it comes to the Fed, it's, you know, there are, Let's take some of these regulatory. I can imagine an objectivist taking a job in one of these regulatory agencies to cut it back, to eliminate it, to make it better, to reduce its negative effect. I can. It's, I have a really hard time imagining what a good Fed policy would be. Right. So even just taking the job as Fed chairman is is hard for me to understand an objectivist doing. Uh, you know, even the, even if you were an inflation fighter, what does that mean? Keeping interest rates high? No, there's no good Fed policy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't help but think, you know, Alan Greenspan might have read this book before, this uh, Atlas Shrugged book, hmm. in which the head of the state it says did. to... to he to read it before it was published. Yes, he yes. did. <laughs> the head of the state says, in the field of production, you'll, we'll do whatever you say. You'll be, you'll be the economic dictator of the nation. And our hero bursts out laughing. Right. Do you mean you're refusing my offer? I am. But why? It took me three hours on the radio to tell you why. What I told you in three hours is that it won't work. Right. right. 
there was a lot he could have done, and maybe there was a lot he did do as the chair of economic advisors. Certainly, that could be a legitimate profession is to be on the President's Council of Economic Advisors and advise him, get the hell out of my way. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, that's but, that's easy. <laughs> what is the valid role of chairman of the Fed other than you know dismantle the, the, the place? To give the history, too, of Dr. Greenspan, when he first got to know Ayn Rand, he was a Keynesian and he was deeply affected by modern philosophy. There's a, a famous story that uh, was told by Ayn Rand's students and friends at the time, that it took some time for Alan Greenspan to even recognize that he existed. So that the joke <laughs> came, you know, someone came to Ayn Rand and told her, Alan exists. <laughs> well, good. excellent, Alan exists, hooray. Uh, but, but he really, he was uh, slow, as it were, in uh, grasping some of Ayn Rand's deeper philosophical arguments. And he really had to be talked out of his Keynes, original uh, moderate Keynesian position that he had at the time. Well, uh, that stuff leaves remnants. Yes. I think it does. And I, I'm too, so one could question how well he understood it in the first place, Although he was teaching, at, you know, the Nathaniel Brandon Institute and writing for Ayn Rand's peri periodicals, praising Ayn Rand left and right, he wrote letters defending Ayn Rand to the press. For example, when Whitaker Chambers did that infamous review in the National Review of Atlas Shrugged, he was one of the people who wrote a letter to to denounce the the review um, uh, long before anyone had ever heard of Alan Greenspan. Uh, but he would defend Ayn Rand. Um, but after Ayn Rand's death, he pretty quickly went south on us, yeah. <laughs> and I think sold out for power. I know there are still people who will argue if it had been somebody else, it would have been even worse. And I'm even willing to accept that much, but that doesn't make it good. Well, you and know, he really basically uh, continued the Volcker poll. Volcker was a Democrat appointed by Jimmy Carter. And he was the guy that, you know, tightened credit and forced interest rates through the roof in the early 80s, squeezing out uh, price inflation, it is true, but causing an enormous recession, of course, which is the necessary end of uh, an inflationary cycle. But Greenspan was basically continuing, he said, the anti-inflationary policies of Volcker. Anyone else could have done that. Who at least was in that camp. Uh, so... Uh, uh, Maybe at the end of the day, it did more to hurt objectivism. And I, uh, on that point in general, all these politicians, usually Republicans, who praise Ayn Rand and then go on to do the most outrageous anti-individual <laughs> anti rights policies, uh, really are hurting, it seems to me, Ayn Rand's reputation. Yeah. The left can say, Oh, yes, you see, uh, this guy, uh, you, you're a Republican over here. He's a classic Randian. And look at the world is screwed up by these Republicans. Sometimes it is screwed up by Republicans. And they'll point to Ayn Rand as the cause. And Greenspan is maybe the biggest and most infamous example of that. Um, he, helps, yeah. he helps more. In other words, I would rather have had some neutral, moderate Volcker clone do basically what Greenspan was going to do anyway. You know, what did Bob Woodward say of uh, Greenspan in his memoir, Maestro? Wasn't that it? The Maestro, that's right. Right, right. Oh, he's the, he can fine tune this economy like no he, one ever had. He's the that. master. And and whatever you get from Alan Greenspan, that's Ayn Rand. That's Ayn Rand. Oh, except it's so promising of consciousness. He's like, let, let me introduce you my fantasy of, of what I think might have been doing in the free market and i shall manipulate things well we but know again, that it's just yeah. crazy but what did he do to the reputation of <laughs> capitalism yes. and objectivism right. in particular you know it was martin anderson who got uh alan greenspan his first job with government as an advisor to nixon because he was an advisor to richard nixon at the time and he too was a friend of ayn rand's and uh before his death i had a chance to talk to martin anderson um, he's the editor of the Reagan papers, right? Mm -hmm. He went that far, you know, Ayn Rand didn't like Reagan at all. And he was Reagan's chief domestic policy advisor when Reagan first came in to office. I, I asked him about Alan Greenspan and it's clear that he had a soft spot for Alan Greenspan, but even he had to say, well, of course, to be Fed chairman, he can't be an objectivist. Point blank, <laughs> point yes. blank. Good, good. Uh, and this was a guy himself who advised Reagan and worked, worked right. in the government for Republicans. Yes.
fairly obvious to those in the know, but yeah, very damaging to those who. Uh, but all yeah. that aside, the article itself is unanswerable. It really is. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good a really article. Perfect article. It Short is. And sweet. Initially, yeah. when when I looked at the list of articles and said, "Oh, you, you need to co-host an episode with James," said, oh, we've got to do that. What's on the list? Oh, well, the next one on the list is the assault on integrity. I thought, oh, Alan Greenspan. I don't know, but it is <laughs> such a good art, and it's only four yeah. pages. Anybody yeah. who hasn't read it yet, uh, get a copy. You've already got one, but get a copy of Capitalism: The Unknown Ideal. Again, the arguments by Greenspan. I I just picture you know Ayn Rand like a little angel on his shoulder <laughs> helping him get it right. But the arguments are unanswerable. It's unanswerable. <laughs> you know, oh, you guys, boy. you're absolutely right. This article is short but so powerful. It is an irrefutable point. I don't see how anyone can really look at the facts and look at the history since, frankly and not come away even more convinced of the of its conclusions as opposed to uh dr greenspan's degeneracy on the point mm -hmm. you know you guys you look at you guys you guys look sharp you guys are wonderful <laughs> and fun please, we're dressed for business today please um, yeah yeah i can tell you were you you were you were loaded for bear for business too um uh to mix my metaphors um please come and join us more please please, yes. please. Uh, anytime we're invited you know oh james you're a personal favorite you of ours are, oh, you, are you bring a clarity to list, ideas james. that Thank nobody you. else I, does it I the just, way you do it i want to give you big kisses right oh i wish i was there to kiss you back <laughs> You two are my, two of my favorite people in the world. So thank you, and thank you for an outstanding discussion. Uh, do we do clubhouse after the essays? I We're, didn't check. I think we may have a clubhouse after this. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more questions, super chat or not? We don't have any more. We had one more super chat. Uh, Apollo Zeus brought in another five dollars for us. Five thank pounds, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, five thank pounds. You. Oh, not dollars. Pounds. pounds. Some real so money. Yeah. Six or seven dollars <laughs> there. So thank you for that. Thank you. If anybody's not already a member of the Ayn Rand Center UK, you need to be a member. Go to aynrandcenter.co.uk. Center is spelled Brit style. R-E at the end. Link will be in the chat. I am honored and proud to be part of the Ayn Rand Center UK's YouTube roster. Amy and I are having the time of our lives yes. clarifying these ideas for ourselves and for your sake. But again, nobody does it better than James. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, well, us. thank you. No, there are so much, there's so much good quality stuff here. We have Harry Benzwanger as a regular feature now. Um, we uh, do the communication boot camp with Don Watkins for subscribers and subscribers only. We do a workshop on Leonard Peikoff's courses on the weekends. Again, subscribers only. So there are great perks you get, great thing. And we record those. So you can actually go back and look at them too if you're a subscriber. So I would urge you uh, uh, very much, I would echo what Robert just said there, I urge you to become a member of Ayn Rand Center UK. We're doing all kinds of exciting work and we do have really some of the best minds and some of the best people in objectivism, like from Harry Binswanger to the yes. wonderful Nacers here. So please, please come and join us. Well, thank you for the discussion, James. This was outstanding. Thank you, James. You're the best. Thank you. You guys are the best.